If you followed any of my stuff over the years, whether you're listening to the Lumber Update podcast or listening to the Wood Talk podcast or watching my woodworking here on the Renaissance Woodworker, it's probably pretty clear that I'm a great big nerd, like a giant nerd who likes physics and likes meteorology and digs the really technical side of things. But I've found that like this has actually helped me teach woodworking because I really nerd out over the minutia of things. One of the things that's really fascinated me is the physics of how a blade cuts wood. Whether it's a chisel or a saw or a hand plane, they're all blades presented to the wood at a certain angle, at a certain sharpness. Well, what does that level of sharpness do to the wood? What does changing the angle do to the wood? And as I begin to dig into this more, I started to realize that this kind of unlocks every problem I've ever encountered in woodworking. Anytime something starts to go wrong, I think about the physics and I can fix the problem. So what follows is an excerpt from a much larger lesson just entitled The Physics of Cutting Wood. Now, of course, this lesson can be purchased at the Hand Tool School at handtoolschool.net, or it could be part of joining as a subscribing member as an apprentice member, and you'll get access to this lesson along with, you know, five or 600 more lessons. The important part is any problem that you encounter in woodworking, if you understand the mechanism that's causing that problem or the mechanism behind what you're trying to do, you often can solve that problem. And sometimes the solution is a different presentation for your plane, or maybe it's sharpening the plane, or maybe it's choosing a different plane or a different saw altogether. Understanding the root cause, the physics of how the blade cuts the wood will set you free. The idea here is to talk about how the blade what, regardless of the blade, whether it's a plane, chisel, saw, um, even a drill, how it actually is cutting the wood and what we understand about the technical properties of the wood and really how uh, changing the angle of attack or changing the angle of the blade, like the bevel angle, what that's going to do. The visual I want you to think about as we're talking through this is Think of like a graphic equalizer or something like, you know, a large cakewalk in a recording studio. Lots of fun dials and you slide it up, you slide it down and it changes things. It changes the, the overall sound. Well, each one of those dials would be labeled to something like bevel angle or wood species, um, tightness of the, the plane mouth, skew angle. And as you change the skew angle of the plane, you're creating a different effect. You have a different outcome. As you change the species, you have a different outcome. If you change the grain direction, so if you're working against the grain, that's a different thing. And you can change that slider. One end is against the grain, one end is with the grain. All of these things, all of these variables is what makes, well, the way I like to think of it is what makes woodworking fun. It's what makes it interesting. If I could tell you, here is the bevel angle you should sharpen your plane blades to. And here is the exact skew angle you should use. And when you encounter tear out, you change the skew angle to this number. Well, that would be, I guess, great. It'd be certainly great for beginners, but it's never gonna be that way. The number of variables in play here like are on par with like an atmospheric system, you know? Trying to guess the weather, which we all know just nobody gets it right because there's so many freaking variables in play. And it's the same situation we have here. But if we understand how we tweak those variables and how we tighten the mouth of the plane or add a, a, ang a higher angle to the frog or change the bevel angle of the blade or change the angle of attack of the blade in the case of a chisel or a card scraper where you have control over that angle attack. But if you start to understand how playing with those variables can help things, you're in good shape. This is your typical 45 degree bevel angle. Here is a much, much higher 60 degree bevel angle. And this is some unknown angle. It's quite low, probably more like a 12 degree angle, like the bed of a bevel or of a low angle plane. I would look at liken this more to something like a chisel, you know, because you can um, certainly you've got the angle that the frog holds your blade at. So here's my smoothing plane and it is a bevel down smoothing plane. So technically the bevel angle doesn't really matter much. It's this presentation angle, this 45 degree angle of my frog that determines this. So this 45 degree angle is the same thing we're seeing in a traditional bench plane with a standard frog. Now, as you get to bevel up planes where the actual bevel angle itself is adding to the bed angle, 
So here is a Veritas bevel up plane. The bed angle is 12 degrees. Um, this in particular has a 50, uh, 52 or no, 50 degree blade in it. So 50 plus 12 is 62. Now this is 60 degrees. Honestly, no, sorry. This is 60 degrees. Honestly, I didn't measure it. I just kind of eyeballed the 60 degree angle. So it could be 62, but just for visual aid purposes, this is your resultant angle of 12 plus 50. And by changing that bevel angle, I can steepen this um, without actually changing any orientation here. But when we get into the really, really low angles, this is what I think of with a chisel. And if I'm pairing with a chisel, kind of the back down and working along a board, I'm working at whatever this bevel angle is, if it's set flat on the board. Now, sometimes you might lift the angle up a little bit and you're increasing the angle, but here again, this is a bevel up instance. So whatever the, the bevel angle is on your chisel is what you're presenting here. With these three visual aids, I've got kind of a wide range of options that you might run into. I also have the uh, super secret option is 90 degrees, um, which could be represented very closely with something like a card scraper. Um, if you don't put a burr on your card scraper and just grind it straight across at 90 degrees and you present it 90 degrees to the work, that's what you're getting. Um, this is also very similar, like if I were to just lean it forward a hair and say I'm presenting it at 80 degrees, same type of situation that's going on here. So we actually have another angle um, that we can show really from one stream to one extreme to another as the wedge comes in and that wedge begins to separate the fiber. Um, you can see that fiber is starting to lift out ahead um, a little bit. This is what causes tear out. At this low angle, I'm not getting too many issues. If I hit this with a 45 degree angle and I'm decidedly working against the, the, the grain here, as that wedge pushes through and it starts lifting higher and higher, I'm hitting uh, a tension point here that as I keep pushing, um, it's, it's going to break. Now, fortunately, my rubber band is allowing some flexion there, but you can see uh, on, a, on, a, on a macro level, I'm starting to create a curl here. This is what actually creates the shavings that curl. When the, um, the fiber loses its integrity, you know, the thickness of the shaving, when it, it's, it's um, not strong enough to resist, and this is uh, 16th inch stringing, and it's maple, so it's, it's quite strong. When it loses that ability to resist the curling, it breaks. And when it breaks, it, you know, it, it, the pressure is released. So as I keep working um, and I keep breaking this shaving, so I'm gonna break it there and then I ride that up and I break it there and that rides up a little bit more and it continues breaking, you can see what's happening. I'm curling into a shaving. Um, so probably something a little bit easier to, to notice on something very flimsy like this construction paper that's now catching on a little bit of a, so it's curling very easily um, because there's very little strength in the construction paper itself. If I were to um, put, and I'm pushing down right in front of the blade, that's the front of the sole pushing down, which is why the tightness of the mouth plays a lot in controlling tear out. Because if the mouth is super tight, I'm applying pressure. So there's the blade. I'm applying pressure like right in front of the blade, and I'm holding this fiber down. If the mouth is wide open and I'm holding the fiber down back here, you can see I'm starting to lift up. I'm starting to get a gap here. And as I'm getting a gap, that's tearing. That's tearing out underneath me. Um, and the wider open that mouth, the more that gap will open. Now, this is not a very big gap because we've got a very pliable, very flexible, flexible shaving. And you think of this as a lighter cut. It's a very thin, smoothing plane type shaving. If I take something that is a super heavy shaving, this is 16th of an inch thick. If you've ever taken a 16th of an inch shaving with a smoothing plane, that's a lot of work. And you can see as I push this in, when I've got pressure way back here, you see that gap that's lifting up as this wedge drives in. 
And you can imagine the amount of tearing. All of this is forcing that fiber away. The fiber itself is strong enough to resist the breakage, to resist the curling effect. So it's coming up and it's causing all of this wood underneath to tear dramatically. The chip breaker is um, an, additional, uh, an additional ramp that is, let's look at it this way. We've got this lower angle and it is slicing into the wood neatly. The sharpness of the blade is slicing in or representing this 45 degree angle and that's working quite well. But without the chip breaker in place, a lot of times that shaving will just ride straight up the blade, just like we're seeing here, just coming up in a straight line and it's not actually breaking. What the chip breaker is doing is adding an additional angle right there, um, just behind the blade and we cause it to break. And you can see now my chip breaker is creating a shaving. Without the chip breaker, well now I've curled my, <laughs> curled my pliable shaving here. Without the chip breaker, it, see it's just running straight and it's you know, coming right back the blade. Throw that chip breaker in, we're still getting the same level of force to pull up the shaving assuming there's not a gap between your chip breaker and your plane, now we've got a curl. And that's, there's the physics of a wood plane right there. Bevel angle will solve some problems for you. I think that angle has been overstated because it will solve some problems. It will solve problems without skill, to put it bluntly. Um, and this school has never been about skimping on skill. This school has always been about teaching skill. Go to the homepage. Hand tools will make you a better woodworker. That's what that means. Hand tools make you more skilled. They force you to be more skilled because we have measly 1 15th horsepower is our power. So we can't rely upon a three horsepower motor to plow through and, and fix a lot of errors. We have to be skilled. We have to have finesse. We have to understand the physics of cutting in order to work at 1 15th horsepower. By, by buying another tool, by buying another blade that will fix it, it will fix it for a while until that blade goes dull. How else can we loosen or lessen that force? You skew the blade. So not only am I presenting at a lower angle, but I'm also kind of slicing my way into the wood. And I will find a lot of times, um, I will start planing. I've got almost a quarter face I'm looking at here. So the grain direction is not gonna be real helpful, but I will find that I will start by skewing and then I like, so, and you can actually see I've started to pull up a shaving. By skewing, it requires very little force to get that shaving started, but I will almost immediately go into straight on. So I've started skewing just to kind of ease my way in. In fact, what I'm doing is engaging just the corner of the blade and kind of rotating the plane in. So mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, if I'm thinking of skewing, I'm actually doing that. I'm holding the plane at a skew angle. This is skewing to enter. So I'm yeah. entering and twisting back in. And that is the same action. Like if you ever used a router plane and you kind of rock the router plane instead of trying yeah. to push it straight in, it's the exact same thing. And it's, it's really great because you can feel it. So there the blade makes contact and the blade is only making contact right on this corner. In fact, there's that little shaving that I just made right on that corner. Mm -hmm. So I feel that, I feel it engage. And instead of pushing it forward at the skew angle, I let it engage and then I slowly rock it around. And now I've got the entire blade engaged. It's that skew to enter type action that's going to mm -hmm. fix a lot of that. Um, because skewing it reduces the force. Um, it reduces the force, but it also reduces the width of the blade. In this instance, all I'm doing is getting a shaving that's like a 16th of an inch across. Now it's an eighth of an inch. Now it's a quarter. Now it's three eighths. Now it's, you know, the full width of the blade. And that will really help that kind of initial kind of snipe that's happening, but it also just makes it easier to engage into the board. But the other thing I can do is, and, and I'll feel it. Sometimes you'll start playing and it's like, oh my God. And it stutters to a stop and you're like stuck there. So what I'll do yeah. is actually back up. Now I've got just the toe coming out here and it gives me a little bit of run up room and I can get that shaving. I can rely upon the mass of the plane 
Mass times acceleration equals force. The greater the mass, mm -hmm. the greater the acceleration, the less force that's required the minute that blade makes contact. And it very quickly gets over that initial hump and I get a, a full length shaving and I don't get that little dimple. So okay. again, all the principles we talked about, it comes down to trying to reduce that force. Um, and a couple ways there, acceleration or like reduce the actual amount of blade that's being presented to it. Good question. Right. Perfect example of what we talked about. Well done. You get a gold star tonight. <laughs> Thank you. So again, what you just saw was an excerpt from the one of more than, I don't know, I think there's 612 lessons right now in the hand tool school. If you're interested in leveling up your woodworking, I highly advise you pick up a hand tool. I don't care if you are a completely electron smashing power tool fanatic, there's going to be a time when a hand plane or really a chisel is going to solve your problem. And increasing your comfort with hand tools is going to make you a better woodworker. That one statement I've built my entire hand tool school business around since 2010. And I firmly believe that after teaching thousands and thousands of people the fundamentals of hand tools, learn how to use hand tools you will be a better woodworker. So check us out at handtoolschool.net or click on the link up here or over here or wherever the heck it shows up on the screen. There's a bunch of different ways that you can learn. If you like a structured kind of step-by-step -step approach, we have what I call semesters. If you just like to learn by building projects, well, I've got a bunch of projects that you can purchase. Or if you really wanna focus on a specific technique, I have lessons, standalone lessons. But then I also have like a subscription model, a recurring subscription, just like Netflix or something like that, where you get access to everything, everything, thousands and thousands of hours of content that I'm adding to every single week.